In this video, we want to develop a model for the kinetic frictional force. Kinetic means movement, and so the agent and the object maintain contact but move relative to each other. We also want at least one surface to be flat, so we can define planes parallel and perpendicular to that surface at the point of contact. Let's watch a video of something experiencing kinetic friction. We saw a book being lifted up. It wasn't moving at the beginning, but eventually it slid down the incline. As it was sliding, we could apply our kinetic friction model, but not before. So what is the kinetic frictional force? To start with, we must find the normal force. So I've established a set of axes for a free body diagram, a set parallel and perpendicular to the ground, and another set parallel and perpendicular to the inclined plane. I've identified the angles on my axes that correspond to the angle of my plane. There's a contact force between the incline and the book. And it's that contact force that we break into components perpendicular and parallel to that surface. First, let's find the normal force. That's the component of the contact force that's perpendicular to the surface. So it's going to point along this direction. Now, our model of the kinetic frictional force says that the magnitude of our frictional force is proportional to the magnitude of the normal force. If it's proportional, that means I can write it in this form. The magnitude of the force is equal to some constant times the magnitude of the normal force. This constant has its own name, the coefficient of kinetic friction. While the coefficient of friction is a constant for any given problem, it varies for every problem. It depends on the materials involved, it depends on the quality of the surfaces, it can even depend on environmental factors, the temperature or the humidity. There are tables that list values for typical substances, but it's something you either have to know or you have to measure. Now the direction of the frictional force in our model is parallel to the contact surface, and opposite the movement of the object relative to the agent. The way to think about that is the frictional force tries to resist the sliding that's taken place. It's sliding down the incline, and so the frictional force on that object is in the opposite direction. So here I've put that frictional force on my free body diagram. As an example of how this works, Let's calculate the coefficient of kinetic friction for the book sliding in the video. I did some measurements of the distance that the book slid down the shelf, as well as the timing from the video, and calculated that the acceleration was 0.6 meters per second squared. From one of the still pictures, I measured the angle at which it started sliding to be about 22 degrees. So let's do a Newton's second law to try to calculate the coefficient of kinetic friction. First of all, my object is my book, and I want to identify my forces on the book. Well, there's gravity, and there's one contact force from the shelf on the book. Now I'm going to break that force into two components, the normal component and the frictional component, perpendicular and parallel to that surface. Because of that, for my free body diagram, I'm going to start with two sets of axes one parallel and perpendicular to the ground, and the other parallel and perpendicular to the incline. I identify the angles between my axes that correspond to this angle, 22 degrees, because that's something I know, and it will help me find my components for my forces. The force due to gravity points towards the center of the Earth, which is down. The normal force points up perpendicular to the incline. And the frictional force points up the incline as the object is sliding down. I need a coordinate system. I've chosen positive x to be down the incline and positive y to be perpendicular. Sometimes if it gets confusing on what's positive, I might put positive and negative x and y on the ends of the axes so I can keep them straight. Next is Newton's second law, which says the vector sum of all the forces is equal to the mass of that one object times the acceleration of that one object. Now I want to find those vectors in component form. 
The gravitational force does not lie along one of the axes, so I have to find its components. So I draw a line from the tip of the vector to one of the axes such that it makes a right angle. With the magnitude of the vector being the hypotenuse of the triangle, then the lengths of the sides are the magnitudes of the components. The length of the x component is the magnitude of the gravitational force, mass times g, times sine theta since this side is opposite the angle. And it's also positive because I note it's on the positive side of the y-axis. The y component has a magnitude of mass times g cosine theta because it's adjacent to the angle. I also note that it's pointing along the negative y-axis. The normal force has no component along the x-axis, which means its entire magnitude points in the positive y. Now the force due to friction, it has no component in the y-axis, so its y component is zero. That means its entire magnitude lies along the x-axis. From our model, that magnitude is the coefficient of kinetic friction times the magnitude of the normal force. And from my diagram, I see that it's pointing along the negative x-axis, so I include that negative sign with the component. And now for the mass times the acceleration, the x component is just the mass times the x component of the acceleration, and the y component of the acceleration is zero because I've set the y-axis to be perpendicular to the plane. Now I can use these to find scalar relationships between my parameters. I'll have mg sine theta minus the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force is equal to the mass times the acceleration down the incline. I also have mg cosine theta plus the magnitude of the normal force is equal to zero. I've rewritten those equations too, and it looks like I have a direction to solve. I can look at this equation and solve for the magnitude of the normal force and then substitute it into the blue equation. The orange one gives me that the magnitude of the normal force is equal to mg cosine theta. If I substitute that into here, I get this. It looks like I can divide out a mass from every term. I bring this term over to the other side because I want it to be positive. And then I bring a to the other side, which makes it negative. And now divide both sides by g cosine theta. I get tangent theta minus a g cosine theta. Now I know all those terms. I measured a and theta from the video so I can go ahead and plug in those numbers. And I get a coefficient of kinetic friction, uh, which is 0.34. Now, you may not know this, but I happen to know that typical coefficients of friction between 0 and 1 are very common, and so this makes sense. A couple things to remember. Each normal force and frictional force are components of the same contact force. And so I might rewrite my definition of the magnitude it's proportional to the magnitude of the normal force of the corresponding contact force. If I were to look at that free body diagram again, I can pull out that normal force, I can add it to the frictional force, and there's the resulting contact force. There was only one agent, and that was the shelf. And then I broke it into its components parallel and perpendicular to the surface. That's important because there can be more than one contact force in a problem. And if there is, you have to know that this relationship links the magnitude of the frictional force and the magnitude of the normal force for a single contact force. And you have to repeat that each time.